A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of King Herod, behold, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is the newborn King of the Jews? We saw his star at its rising and have come to do him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was greatly troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it has been written through the prophets, And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, since from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and ascertained from them the time of the star's appearance. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the child. When you have found him, bring me word that I too may go and do him homage. After their audience with the king, they set out. And behold, the star that they had seen at its rising preceded them until it came and stopped over the place where the child was. They were overjoyed at seeing the star, and on entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. They prostrated themselves and did him homage. Then they opened their treasures and offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed for their country by another way. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Merry, Christmas. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Happy, New Year. Happy, Epiphany. Happy Epiphany. Yeah, we just keep celebrating this time of year. It just goes on and on and on. I'm sure, like many of you, um, who had many guests in over the holidays, I had some friends come visit too. In particular, just this last week, I got a chance to catch up with a family. I did their wedding, I don't know how many years ago, but I hadn't seen some of them in as long as 12 years. They're in the Air Force, and right now they're stationed in Southern California for four months just getting some training. And while here, they've been traveling the state. And when we sat to share lunch, they just went on and on about how magnificent California is, how much there is here to do. They're from Iowa. Um, <laughs> just the uh, San Francisco and L.A. and the beaches and the mountains and Tahoe and Yosemite and all that stuff. And of course, as they were going through all the wonders of the state that we call home, um, I was revisiting in my mind the different places I had been. And uh, I remembered that the very first time I went to Yosemite, I was in eighth grade. It was a trip, and um, I forget how many of us there were. There were all these boys. We were jammed in a little cabin together, and it smelled like a lot of boys jammed in a cabin together. But there came a point after touring and seeing things in the valley that we packed up our backpacks and our sleeping bags, and we hiked out of the valley and went and camped out under the stars for I forget how many nights. But I remember very clearly that first night camping out that we had fallen asleep and I woke up in the middle of the night, and looking through the trees at the night sky, I could not figure out what I was seeing above me. I laid there just boggled by all the radiant light, and what was that? And finally I realized I was seeing for the very first time in my life the Milky Way. Just astounding, the billions and billions of stars that were just tracing across the sky, which I had never seen before because living here in the Bay Area, there's so much light pollution at night, you just don't get to see that. Um, despite the wonders of El Capitan and, and Half Dome and the waterfalls, it was that awesome, ancient Milky Way that just to this day gives me chills. Just, I didn't sleep the rest of that night. I just, once I figured out what it was, I just stared at it all night long. The ancient people who didn't have the problem of, of light pollution uh, never forgot the night sky. It was so incredibly important to them, as I think we all know, especially in places east of Israel, places east of Palestine, um, where there were not scriptures 
that forbade the study of the sky, that forbade astrology. In places like Babylon and Persia, there grew up sort of a pseudoscience, a fine art of reading the skies, reading the night skies, figuring out what was going on. And they had this beautiful sense that everything was of one piece, that if something magnificent happened in the skies, it meant something magnificent was happening on earth. And if something magnificent happened on earth, it was reflected in the skies because everything was connected. It's like the butterfly effect on an intergalactic scale. Something happens, it's reflected in everything else. And so we come to Matthew's story today about the Magi who would have studied the night sky. You notice Matthew doesn't call them kings. They probably were not kings. In Persia and Babylon, they would have been something more along the lines of priests, I would say. Some sort of cross between astronomer and astrologer, who were very, very adept at reading the signs, reading portents, telling you what their dreams were. Today, they would be your psychic palm readers. They'd be the folks with the tarot cards. They'd be the Sylvia Browns. They would be those folks who try to tell you what's going on in your life. They try to divine it for you. And so they would have been very adept at looking at the night sky, and different things would have had different meanings for them. So when this new star appears, believing that everything's of one fabric, it obviously means that there's something new on Earth. Scholars have spent a lot of time trying to figure out what is this star that Matthew talks about. Um, we do know that between the year 12, 11 BC, Halley's Comet came by. But that would be too early for our story of the birth of Jesus. Um, was it a supernova? Maybe. Um, in my reading, the thing that seems to make the most sense to me is this, is that around the time of the birth of Christ, three times Saturn and Jupiter came in conjunction with each other. And you know when planets get together, they appear very, very bright in the night sky. And interestingly, for the ancient Persians, Jupiter, being the largest planet, was the kingly planet. It was the royal planet. It was the planet that led the way. And Saturn, for whatever reason, we don't know why, but Saturn stood for the Jewish people. So when the kingly planet and the planet representing the Jewish people come together, it all adds up. There's a new king of the Jews. Grab your camels, let's go. <laughs> and so that's what they did. But what's so very interesting about that is that for them, in their art, in their knowledge, they understood what they were seeing. They understood what they were seeing, and it affected how they thought and the action they took. They understood what they were seeing, and it affected how they thought and the action they took. Interestingly, eventually their art... Their, their astrology fails them because the star takes them where? To Jerusalem. They walk into the city going, uh, where's the newborn king of the Jews? And no one has an idea what's going on. They actually end up having to go to the scriptures to find Jesus. They have to go to the scriptures to find Jesus. And once it's clear to them where they're supposed to go, oh, then the star leads on. And they get there to the manger. Now, for us, we are so used to the magi, or the wise men, or the kings, if you prefer, appearing in Christmas cards, and in Christmas stories, and in manger sets, that for us, they're very welcome. There's something sort of heartwarming and wonderful, and they, they added a wonderful element to the Christmas story. These exotic men who travel following a star at night across the desert who come dressed in fancy robes that are embroidered, who come with their strange Persian ways bearing incense and spice that fills the air. They're remarkable. But that's not at all what Matthew's people would have heard when Matthew told them Magi came. For us, we've romanticized who they are. For Matthew's audience, it would have been something entirely different. Because the Old Testament has some pretty choice words about magi, about astro uh, astrologers, about anything involving divination. The Old Testament would have called them idolatrous deceivers. Idolatrous deceivers. And we know what idolatry is like for the Jewish people. And deceivers. Matter of fact, shortly before the birth of Christ, a rabbi wrote that 
anyone who learned from magi were worthy of death. That's how they would have viewed the magi. These are idolatrous deceivers involved in divination arts that are absolutely forbidden to God's holy and chosen people. So what does Matthew say? What, huh? How is it that Matthew have told us this is the Christ, the Savior is here, and then these idolatrous deceivers who are doing things that God forbids show up? What is that about? Well, while we're gathering at the manger, what about the shepherds? <laughs> shepherds. The shepherds come from Luke's story. You don't find the magi and the shepherds in the same gospel. Magi come from Matthew, shepherds come from Luke. But again, we have romanticized the shepherds. We see them as beautiful images of caring and warmth and loveliness. And believe me, in that day and age, they weren't. We've talked a bit about this before. They were outcasts. There was no way that they could keep the requirements of their society in terms of the law, in terms of religious observance. So they were outcasts. They, they were so looked down upon that they were forbidden to be witnesses in court. They were forbidden f from so many parts of their regular society. They would tramp across your land trespassing, their flocks making a disaster of what you owned. They were dirty, they were distrustful, they were poor, they were just not people that decent people hung around with. But Luke includes them in the scripture story of Jesus' birth. What is happening here? What is happening here? Do we know what we're looking at? What we get here gathered under one roof, if you will, is a glimpse, a foreshadowing of the gospels that will be told. That this infant, this Christ, that attracts a hodgepodge of idolaters, deceivers, outcasts, the distrusted, those who can't keep their faith, that this same Christ will magnetically attract Samaritan adulterers and guilty prostitutes, tax collectors on the take, hated Roman occupying soldiers who bully, ostracized, diseased lepers. He will attract them all. What the gospel authors are trying to tell us, well, they're not trying to vindicate divination. And they're not trying to vindicate any of the actual terrible things that shepherds would do. What they're trying to demonstrate is the limitless reach of God's grace. The limitless reach of God's grace. And that would be an epiphany, a revelation to those who would assume there are people beyond God's grace. What the gospel authors are showing us in this manger set, in the nativity stories, is that the grace Jesus brings is for all. There is no one beyond God. Once you take away our romantic visions, that's what we're seeing. Can we let what we see, what we know, affect how we think and how we live? Can we be as wise as the magi in that? In what we see and what we now know, can we let that affect how we live and how we think? Actually, coming at the beginning of a new year, Epiphany, I think, poses a very interesting question. And the question is this. How open are we willing to let our church, our homes, how wide open can our hearts be to those who we might accidentally believe are beyond God's grace, whose way of living, whose race, whose nationality, even whose faith is different than ours? It's been said before, but it bears repeating. In God's eyes, everyone is equal. And we are now the body of Christ on earth. We are God's representatives on earth. And we cannot raise roadblocks anywhere to the people who God draws to himself. We would do well to reflect upon at our table or at your table at home. When was the last time 
that someone of another race, another nation, another economic standing, another faith sat down to eat with you or was an invited guest or swam in your pool. And if it's been a while, why would that be? I mean, in another week or so, that manger set will be packed up, everything will be put back in boxes, stored back in the garage. We won't see it for another year. But wouldn't it be lovely if the manger of our lives, our hearts, would continue to be open so that anyone whom the Christ child draws, that Jesus brings during the year, that they would find no roadblock to God's grace in us, in who we are as a community, as families, and as individuals. That we would live Christmas, live the manger, gather under one roof, everyone, because no one is beyond the reach of God's grace. We know what we're looking at. Can we let that affect the way we think and the way we act?